Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is the fourth lecture of the series of disorders of bone lectures. And in this lecture, we will talk about tumors of bone, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, hemangioma of bone, and metastatic tumors. The bone tumors um, are uncommon in the jaws, the primary bone tumors. The secondary bone tumors include those metastasizing to the bone. So primary, they originate from the bone itself, from the marrow, cartilage, bone, fibrous tissue, vascular elements present within the marrow. And these tumors can be benign and malignant. If we go to the classification, uh, they are classified according to the tissue of etiology or tissue of origin. They can be uh, from the bone forming or cartilage forming or marrow tumors, fibrous tumors, and tumor-like lesions in bone. In the uh, category of bone forming tumors, these tumors include benign and malignant, benign osteoma and osteoblastoma, Malignant is osteosarcoma. If you go to the cartilage forming, the benign is chondroma. The malignant is the chondrosarcoma. And in the marrow tumors, we have myeloma and other types, fibrous tumors like the central ossifying fibroma and tumor-like lesions, including Langerhans cell histiocytosis and hemangioma of bone. Okay. Now, general points about bone tumors. Benign bone tumors, like the osteoma, can be radiolucent or radioopaque, according to the, um, to the activity of the tumor cells within the tumor. Because, and also the type of bone they are producing. Cancerous bone is relatively radiolucent compared to the uh, compact bone. Uh, the tumors, the benign tumors, typically expand the jaws and are well circumscribed, of course, because they are of benign origin, meaning they are slowly growing, so they will be well circumscribed. And the, their treatment is excision with a narrow margin. While malignant tumors, on the other hand, are destructive, poorly demarcated or less well circumscribed, they are not well circumscribed actually, and they can cause tooth exfoliation. So if you have a tumor and you want to, cons to, to think about whether it looks um, benign or malignant, you need to, you need to consider the, um, how this tumor is affecting the surrounding tissues and surrounding structures. If this tumor is causing uh, root resorption, loss of teeth, a destruction of the surrounding tissue, so consider malignant tumors or locally aggressive tumors. If this tumor is well circumscribed, displacing the teeth, then it means it is slowly growing, so we go uh, more toward the benign process. Okay, the first benign tumor of bone forming tumors is osteoma. It is, uh, because it's benign, it is slowly growing. It is consisting of mature bone. It can be subperiosteal, meaning just below the periosteum. Okay, or it can be central, meaning within the bone itself. And you can um, find only a mild expansion of the um, alveolar process. Uh, majority are diagnosed in the adult life. They are solitary, single tumor like this, or multiple. And you know, if we have multiple tumors or multiple lesions of the same type, we usually think about syndromes. So multiple osteomas occur in a syndrome called Gardner syndrome. You remember that um, we talked Gardner syndrome when we talked about the multiple supernumerary teeth. They also occur in Gardner syndrome. Osteoma can start centrally from within or from inside the bone itself, and they can cause expansion and swelling of the mandible. They can appear radiolucent if the bone formed here is of the cancellous type. Uh, yes, cancellous type. And they can look more radioopaque, like other examples that we will see later on. 
Um, they will look radio-opaque if they are compo composed of this compact bone with uh, relatively very little myospaces compared to the cancellus. So from here you can tell that this osteoma will appear radio-opaque radiographically, while this one will be relatively radiolucent. So osteoma is a benign tumor. It will show continuous growth, but it is slow. Continuous expansion, but it is slow expansion. Radiographically, it will be well defined. And histologically, two types, compact or cancellous. This bone is compact. It is vital bone because I can see these osteocytes within the lacuni. Do you remember when we talked about uh, the sequestrum in osteomyelitis and we said that these pieces of bone are non-vital and we did not see any osteocyte in the lacuni. But here this is vital lamellar bone because we see these horizontal uh, parallel uh, lines um, that indicates that this bone is mature. Multiple osteomas, as we mentioned, occur in a syndrome which is called Gardner syndrome. Look at this patient in the mandible. And the mandible, by the way, is a common location for uh, osteomas, if it is not the most common. Let us just double check it if it is um, the most common location. Okay, we'll find it later, inshallah. But it is um, the mandible and the angle of the mandible are good locations for osteomas. Um, they occur in Gardner syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant syndrome. If you remember the multiple impacted teeth and multiple supernumerary teeth. There are other findings. The, the significant finding in this syndrome is having the polyposis coli, intestinal polyps that have increased chance for malignant change. It is not like Pete's Jigger syndrome that uh, is having um, multiple polyps that do not have increased malignant potential. The Gardner syndrome is having multiple polyps that have malignant, a higher tendency for malignant change. In addition to other findings like um, skin cysts and tumors, fibrous tumors of the skin. Okay, this is a well demarcated, well defined radio opaque mass occurring at the angle of the mandible. Another um, well-demarcated radio-opaque mass, its density is similar to the bone, and it is also in the mandible. A third well-demarcated radio-opaque mass at the angle of the mandible, and a fourth. All of these are multiple osteomas occurring in a Gardner syndrome. Now, osteoblastoma, on the other hand, it causes pain. It causes nocturnal pain, which is pain at, at night. And it is uh, histologically and radiographically, it resembles the, the cementoblastoma. You remember the cementoblastoma that is composed of radio-opaque and radiolucent areas. And the radio-opaque areas are similar in density to the bone or close in density to the bone because cementum structure is close to that of the bone. So the radio density is similar or close to each other. And the in cementoblastoma, it is surrounded by a radiolucent rim. Here we have the cells that are forming the tumor and that are proliferating at the, in this zone in both cementoblastoma and in osteoblastoma. The difference between osteoblastoma and cementoblastoma is that the osteoblastoma is not attached to the roots. In this case, the mass is attached to the root, while in cementoblastoma it is not attached. While in, uh, sorry, in osteoblastoma it is not attached. Osteoblastoma, it is not attached to the root. For example, this is a mass, well demarcated, radio-opaque, radio-opacity is similar to the bone, surrounded by radiolucent zone. And if I will take another radiograph, uh, radiograph I will um, appreciate that this mass is not attached to the cementum or not attached to the root. So this is osteoblastoma. 
The third tumor is osteosarcoma and it is malignant tumor. And it is a primary tumor of bone. It is the most common primary malignant tumor of bone. So go back to the primary tumors of bone and check that you are familiar with the uh, tissue of origin, bone forming, cartilage forming from marrow spaces, vascular or fibrous. And the most common one is osteosarcoma. Although it's the most common, but it is generally relatively rare in the jaws. It is more common in the long bones. And if it will occur in the jaws, it's usually around 30 years uh, of age. And so in general, it is later, it occurs later than osteosarcoma in other body parts or other body bones. And it still occasionally can occur in, in older patients. And please remember that Paget disease of bone might have osteosarcoma as one of its complications. Now, we need to appreciate, you as a general dentist, you need to appreciate the, that your patient with certain clinical features need immediate referral for biopsy because he might have a malignant process. At least this is the minimum amount of information or knowledge you should have about these tumors. You should realize when you need to refer the patient. Here the presenting symptoms for osteosarcoma, how osteosarcoma is dealing with the surrounding structures, with teeth, with bone, with soft tissues, is that by causing pain, swelling, paresthesia. It also press on the nerves or maybe um, infiltrate into the nerves. Um, it can loosen and displace the teeth. It can cause bleeding. It can be it can cause destruction and excessive expansion, as you can see here. So this is how osteosarcoma treats the surrounding tissue. It is completely different from the osteoma. Radiographically, it can be radiolucent, radio-opaque, or mixed according to the uh, type of the, um, or not the type, according to the activity of the osteoblasts, how much they are forming bone, because, and also the variant of the osteosarcoma. Some osteosarcomas look most, most, uh, in the most part, looks like myxoid with the malignant woven bone is formed only in some areas. So there is wide variability in the um, radiographic features and in the histopathologic features of osteosarcoma. Okay. Radiographically, we will check now some examples. The, there may be widening of the PDL in, um, periodontal ligament space and this widening can be symmetrical and this is a classic feature. It is seen in osteosarcoma and in chondrosarcoma too. Okay, let's take a look at this radiograph, this occlusal radiograph. This is the cortical portion of the mandible and you can appreciate the sun ray pattern of bone formation in this tumor which is a feature of osteosarcoma. Sun ray pattern is not pathognomonic, meaning it is not only seen in osteosarcoma, but it is very suggestive of osteosarcoma. If you take, if you look at these periapical radiographs, they, you will see that there is increased space of the premolar tooth. And let's go now to the premolar tooth on the right. Here, you see that the PDL is wide, widened, slightly widened actually. Let us see this next example. Um, I'm sure there is another example that shows better widening like this. Look at the PDL space in this premolar. It is widened, obviously widened. And here also in this smaller. So the, why is that? It has been mentioned that the malignant cells can spread in, through the PDL space. So one of the theories about the widening is that the malignant cells spread through the PDL space. It is called symmetrical widening of the PDL. This is the example, and there is loss of the lamina dura involving the interdental bone between right permanent mandibular second premolar and the first molar in this area, one here, and this is the second. 
Look how osteosarcoma is treating the surrounding teeth. It is causing tooth resorption. And here we see radiolu relatively radiolucent lesion. It is LD L demarcated, so I cannot say that it stops here, maybe, or there. So generally, it is poorly demarcated. Okay, here in this patient, you will see that the border of the lesion in the mandible is poorly defined. Poorly defined here because of the penetration of the tumor throughout the cortex of the mandible. Sunray appearance present only in 25% of the cases and as we said, it is not unique to osteosarcoma. It can be seen in other conditions. But this is the sunray appearance of the bone trabeculae formed by the tumor of the mandible. Again, another example here. Here you can you cannot even delineate, you cannot demarcate where is the tumor. There are areas of radiolucency here mixed with radio density, radio dense areas, but I don't know where is the margins. I see widening of the PDL for this tooth in this area. And I see Sunday appearance in this region. Microscopically, first you have to say and to tell that these cells are highly pleomorphic. They show variation in size and shape. And if we go to this section, I see that there is bone formation. How I know that I'm having bone from the hyalinization and the this color, which is hematoxylene rich, it means mineralization. So this is the bone matrix, and these are areas of mineralization. How I know that I am looking at a malignant tumor? Because I, can, I look at the osteocytes in their lacunae. They are hyperchromatic and pleomorphic. I look at the cells here forming the osteoid, and they are embedded within the osteoid itself. They are pleomorphic hyperchromatic and pleomorphic. Now, in the exam, I will not bring you a, a, a picture that will not be really obvious, that uh, will not be a very good example on osteosarcoma or a malignant tumor. If I want you to answer um, a, an answer about malignancy, I should bring you something that clearly is showing the malignancy. This hyalinized area is um, woven bone, and these cells are hyperchromatic cells. They are osteoblasts embedded within the woven bone, so we call this malignant osteoid. Malignant osteoid. Malignant osteoid, even it doesn't have a lamellar pattern, it looks like woven bone. So don't worry for the exam, you will have enough data to allow you or enable you to say this is malignant or this is osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma can arise centrally inside the bone itself and they can be peripherally. Peripherally meaning just subperiosteal, under the periosteum, without starting or originating in the um, uh, central part of the bone, in the medullary part of the bone. Of course, the juxtacortical or the subperiosteal have better prognosis than the intramedullary type. Their treatment, different modalities, but what is common is to use chemotherapy first to make the tumor to get smaller, and then the tumor is excised with radical surgery. Why mandibular tumors have better prognosis? Because uh, they can be easily, or because the surgery can have more safe margins easily than that when it occurs in the maxilla. Anatomy, يعني له علاقة بالمكان لسهولة إجراء العملية. كمان لقلة يعني المرو spaces compared with the maxilla there is differences in the marrow spaces. Now we'll talk about. Uh, chondroid forming or cartilage forming tumors. We have chondroma benign, chondrosarcoma malignant. Chondrosarcoma sites, um, preferably, or it occurs more in the maxilla than 
demandable and it occurs more in the anterior maxilla. Why? Because we have remnants of cartilage. In embryogenesis, there are remnants of cartilage in the anterior maxilla. And if it occurred in the mandible, it prefers to occur in the posterior mandible because we have cartilaginous center of growth in the head of the condyle posteriorly in the mandible. So they may occur in the condylar process also. The chondroma is a benign tumor of, uh, which is cartilage forming tumor. It is composed of mature cartilage. You, you can, I think you know that the, this is the lacunae where um, the chondro site reside. And this is the um, a cartilaginous matrix. It is semi eosinophilic, semi basophilic in between its color. If there is chondrosarcoma, or if you find, um, if you are suspicious that this lesion can be osteochondrosarcoma, sorry, chondrosarcoma, you will see pleomorphism uh, by nucleation with hyperchromatic cells, variability in size of the chondrocytes that are located within lacunae within this chondroid matrix. And actually, this is the chondrosarcoma. In this case, you can be suspicious. Okay, you need further examination. But in this case, it is very obvious that we have this chondroid matrix, which looks, uh, we call it amphophilic, meaning it is not, um, you see in rich, you see in rich, meaning not red and not blue. It is in between. It's homogeneous and looks like a glassy like the glass. Look at the cells, the chondrocytes within lacuni. They are hyperchromatic, pleomorphic. Sometimes you find binucleation and sometimes you find mitotic figures. Treatment is surgery, better prognosis for mandibular chondrosarcomas, and of course, better prognosis for the well-differentiated variants compared to the poorly differentiated. Now, we finished bone-forming tumors, cartilage-forming tumors. Now, we will start with bone marrow tumors, and we will talk about myeloma. It's a neoplasm of plasma cells. It can be solitary. It can be multiple. If it is solitary, it can be called plasma cytoma. It can occur uh, centrally. It occurs centrally within the bone or um, can be peripherally. And even those patients with solitary lesion, single lesion, can develop later on multiple myeloma. Look at these cells. They are plasma-like cells. I will say like because now they are malignant. Look at the um, abundant or plenty of cytoplasm. Look at the nucleus, which is pushed to one side. This is the plasma cell. Multiple myeloma presents as multiple radiographically as multiple punched out radiolucencies punched out because you don't have um, a sclerotic margin at the periphery. They are just um, radiolucent circles, okay, but without a radio opaque margin. They are called punched out. This appearance is called punched out appearance in the bone. Multiple myeloma is aggressive. It can destroy the bone. Teeth can be loosened and they are they lose support. It is ill-defined. Uh, it can um, leave the bone and perforate the bone and uh, infiltrate the surrounding gingiva and the soft tissues. Um, so it is a neoplastic process, and it is neoplastic proliferation of a single clone of immunoglobulin-producing cells, meaning that there is monoclonal proliferation of plasma cells, meaning that plasma cells, those neoplastic plasma cells, are producing just a single immunoglobulin chain. 
and or a single immunoglobulin type. For example, they will produce only IgG. And sometimes they produce only kappa chain or lambda chain because it is monoclonal. But in the normal process of inflammation, we have polyclonal proliferation. So if we performed kappa stain and lambda stain, we will find mixture of, bo of both stains in the uh, reactive and inflammatory processes. While in the neoplastic process, we will find only a single clone, which is the, um, we call it M protein. So if we look at this serum electrophoresis results, we normally should have um, close distribution of the types of the um, chains of the immunoglobulins. However, in this patient, the this chain is showing a spike. A single chain is showing a big spike compared to the other chains. Here we have alpha one, alpha two, beta, and gamma. Look at this chain; it's show, it's, it is showing a spike. What do we call this spike? It is called M spike or M protein. It means that this is a single type of a chain or of an immunoglobulin that is rising very high, abnormally high. Now this green is this green spike here. It is this is normal. This is the albumin. It is not one of the uh, immunoglobulins or their um, chains. Clinical features. So before we go to clinical features, please make sure that you understood the etiology. It is monoclonal proliferation of plasma cells or precursor. It is uh, it will form a single clone. Sorry, it is single clone or monoclonal proliferation. It will produce a large amounts of a single immunoglobulins or its constituents polypeptide chains, like either a specific type of the immunoglobulins or a specific chain of the immunoglobulins. Clinically, as we said, punched out appearance, it can be involving the skull, ribs, sternum, pelvis, um, the sites of the red marrow. The common sites of the multiple myeloma are those of the red marrow because it is the producing marrow, the, the hematopoietic marrow, which is having the precursors of the blood, blood cells. So the red marrow occurring in these um, bones, skull, vertebra, sternum, lips, pelvic bones, these are the most commonly affected. Jaws can be involved the mandible and the maxilla, they can be the initial site, but they are commonly part of the more disseminated picture. The patients will have bone pain, maybe vertebral fractures. It is an extensive disease and disseminate, extensive meaning it is disseminated involving multiple, multiple bones. Its diagnosis is by electrophoresis. Look here and compare the normal here, the normal serum, okay, no, um, let's read this caption of the diagram. In A, it is the normal serum. And in B, here, we will have the multiple myeloma serum. In the normal serum, what do we have? The highest intensity is for albumin, okay? While the rest components are all close together. There is no any component is close to the albumin in intensity. But if you look at the blood from B here, this is multiple myeloma because albumin is high or it is in more intense. While, and there is another peak or another intensity which is high in the gamma here, in this gamma area. Here again in C and D, you will find the electrophoresis of a normal patient and of myeloma patient. In the normal patient, we find a spike in the albumin, while the rest are not having spikes. While in the multiple myeloma patient, there is a spike in the albumin and another spike, which is the M spike in the gamma region, uh, similar to what we have seen in this uh, patient serum. Actually, these uh, all are for the same patient. Um, 
What I mean is that A and C are for the normal patient, B and D are for the multiple myeloma patient. Treatment will include bisphosphonates because bisphosphonates will uh, limit the osteoclastic activity and it will allow the affected bone to be calcified and uh, reduce the amount of the osteo um, of the resorption of bone. Okay, but there is a disadvantage of bisphosphonate that the patient might be at risk of osteonecrosis. The diagnosis, as we said, by electrophoresis, you will identify the M spike uh, by also identifying Bins Jones proteins. Uh, this Bins Jones protein is light chains released in the urine. Okay, but it is identified in only 50% of the patients. So 50% with multiple myeloma will have Benz Jones proteins negative results. And calcium level in the blood, those patients might have hypercalcemia because of the bone resorption. And in these conditions, we might have excessive amount of amyloid production, which is a certain protein. Uh, it's a type of protein that can be deposited in the kidneys, in the tongue, in the brain, in wherever they, uh, in, in any organ, and that can induce complications according to the organ they precipitate or they deposit in. Multiple myeloma, look at the punched out appearance. Circles of radiolucent areas surrounded with no radio-opaque margin. The involvement of the pelvis, involvement of the skull. Okay. Microscopically, here you see plasma cells, plenty of cytoplasm, uh, eccentrically placed nuclei. These in, uh, nuclei are rounded, but they are pleomorphic. We have different sizes and different staining characteristics. And even here, this cell is having three nuclei in the same cell. Here, also two nuclei that are hyperchromatic. Here, this is a mitotic body or mitosis going on here, which is star-shaped. It is irregular. It's abnormal mitosis. So this is for sure a malignant process. Okay, this bone origin, sorry, this tumor now of bone we will talk about is called ossifying fibroma. The, it's, it is fibroma, but this fibroma is ossifying. This tumor we talked about, I'm not sure if we talked about in the fibrosseous lesions at the beginning of the lectures about bone, because in the ossifying fibroma, the histopathologic feature is that of fibrosseous lesion, which is similar to fibrous dysplasia and, fib and cementoosseous dysplasia. Okay, now we are talking about ossifying fibroma. It is a well-demarcated lesion. It is uh, having a radiolucent rim surrounding it. It can be removed as one piece. Usually, it consists of fibrous tissue containing varying amounts or amounts of bony trabeculae, so the fibrosseous lesions that we talked about previously. It is a benign tumor, so it is slowly growing but progressively enlarging. Um, most common in the mandibular region, especially the posterior premolar molar region, um, wide age range, female predominance. It can appear radiographically as completely radiolucent or mixed radiolucent, radio-opaque, but all the times it is well demarcated. So if I gave you a histopathologic section of fibro-osseous fibro lesion, and then I gave you the radiograph of a well demarcated lesion, you will not choose fibrous dysplasia. Okay, you will, you will go more with ossifying fibroma because it is well demarcated. If I gave you the uh, histopathologic picture of fibrosseous lesion, but it is well demarcated and attached to the apical region of the mandible, uh, sorry, of the mandibular anteriors incisors, then you will go with cementoosseous dysplasia. 
So the histopathology is fibro-osseous lesion. This is the fibrous trauma and this is the trabeculae of bone. So go back to the fibrous dysplasia and cemento-osseous dysplasia because they will be your differential diagnosis of the histopathologic section of fibro-osseous lesion. But underline the well circumscribed for ossifying fibroma. In ossifying fibroma, some calcifications can be like spherical or rounded deposits. They uh, are acellular. You know that osteoid, if you go back to the bone formation uh, or early osteoid formation, it has these osteocytes and, uh, surrounded by the woven bone, and we call them osteocyte. But here, these are called samoma bodies. Some MoMA bodies, they are like the sand. These are acellular calcified material. So they can be also seen in ossifying fibroma. But they should not always be seen, actually. Okay. Now, ossifying fibroma can also be associated with a syndrome uh, that is it's hereditary syndrome. It is hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome. Hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome. So if somebody asked you what is the tumor, the jaw tumor that is associated with the hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome, you will say ossifying fibroma. And there is a variant of ossifying fibroma that is juvenile. And usually the juvenile tumors are rapidly growing and they are more aggressive and they are more cellular, mitotically active, but they are still benign. They contain immature woven bone. It is difficult to diagnose histopathologically because it is of high cellularity, acti mitotic activity is high, and the, even the, the bone formation is immature, so we need to correlate the radiographic features with the histopathologic. We need to take consultations from other histopathologists and to completely exclude the osteosarcoma or to go more toward benign but juvenile process. And in this juvenile ossifying fibroma, it has higher recurrence rate than the regular ossifying fibroma. Now we will talk about Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Do you remember TAG-Z, Tag -Z, which is traumatic ulcerative granuloma with stromal eosinophilia? And when we said in TAG-Z, we see deep inflammation going down all the way to intermingle with the skeletal muscles. And it was formed by histiocytes mixed with eosinophils. That was tag -Z. Now we are talking about Langerhans cell histiocytosis. It is completely different than Tagzi. And its nature, whether it is malignant or locally destructive, is still not very much clear, but it is a locally aggressive tumor. It can be present clinically in three types, clinically. The same histopathology, but clinical presentation is different. It can be just a unifocal eosinophilic granuloma, okay, which is a solitary lesion, but it can be multiple involving bone and other organs, and it can be disseminated involving multi-organs, uh, more disseminated than the second variant. So it can be just a single lesion, but what we usually do if we identify these um, histiocytes with the eosinophils, okay, we request CD1A stain. CD1A stain, it stains a protein that is common, uh, that is present in the histiocytes. And if we find it positive in these histiocytes, then it means this is monoclonal and we are talking about Langerhans cell disease. We are not talking about a reactive process. The uh, gray colored text, it is not required for the exam. You can read it just for your information. Langerhans cell histiocytosis is more common in children and it's less common in adults, more common in the mandible, 
than the maxilla. It can be single and it can be multiple. Here we have a radiolucent lesion surrounding this, the first premolar, the mandibular first premolar. It caused a lot of radiolucency and loss of bone around this premolar. Um, it can be multiple. Okay, so in Langerhans cell histiocytosis, we can have, uh, as we said, single lesion or multiple lesions. Okay, radiographic features, radiolucent lesion, vari variable amount of destruction. It can be localized, it can be um, multiple. Uh, so there is extensive destruction, there is loosening of the teeth, and the teeth sometimes appear like floating in air. Usually we use this term for Langerhans cell histiocytosis, radiographic features, that these are the teeth, but everything surrounding them is black, is like no bone, as if they are flying in the air. Microscopically, we see... Uh, two different types of cells. One is this large cell that resembles the histiocyte and it has kidney-shaped, look at this nucleus, kidney-shaped nucleus, a lot of cytoplasm. More than uh, example, we 